Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. Hey everyone, welcome to Midnight Chats. This is episode 71 and thank you for downloading it. We know that there are now a hundred million podcasts out there for you to listen to. It's a very crowded marketplace. So the fact that you've taken the time to listen to this one means a great deal to us. My name's Stuart and tonight my guests on the podcast are Lias and Nathan Saudi, both from the South London band Fat White Family, who I guess are a group who more than anyone else or more than anyone else I can think of who have a reputation that tends to precede them which is sometimes a bit of a shame because Fat White Family makes some really great records but it it might be that you know more stories of outrage about Fat White Family than you do songs and a lot of that comes down to the band's drug use and use of hard drugs which is something that to their credit they have always been very open about They've never hidden anything. They've been very honest and very forthcoming with that part of their lives and how it affects them and the stress that that puts upon the group and the relationships within the group. So we we do talk a bit about that within this episode of the podcast. It seems like something that is unavoidable talking about, but mainly the reason I met up with Lias and his brother Nathan was to talk about their brand new record. It came out today. It's their third album. It's called Surf's Up. And today being Good Friday is the day that it's out. So you can you can go and check out this record as soon as you've finished listening to this episode of the podcast. The main thing I guess we talk about is how the group removed themselves from the South London scene where where they were getting so distracted and there was just a lot of mess in their lives. And they moved up to Sheffield into a house up there to record and make this record together. We talk a lot about that. And there is a warning that I have to let you know about, which is towards the end of the podcast, right at the end, there is a scatological story from Leas, which, you know, is pretty gross. It's a pretty gross story that involves human feces. Now, that might be something that you definitely do not want to hear. When it comes up in, in the conversation towards the end, you, you will be able to sense it. You will be able to stop the podcast at that point. But equally, if maybe you don't even want to risk that and you want to stop listening now, that's obviously completely fine. We will see you next week um, at the same time. But if you are still here, there's a lot of kind of fun in this podcast as well. I enjoyed talking to to Nathan and Leas because, you know, as a couple of brothers, I have an older brother myself and brothers have got this weird tension about them especially if you're in a band as kind of chaotic as fat white family i imagine so it was really nice to talk to them they had just come from rehearsal or they were about to go to a rehearsal they're rehearsing this week near our um, near our office so they came by and i think they were feeling a bit stressed about that but um, i had a good time talking to them so thank you to both the guys for coming in and um, enjoy this episode of the podcast of course as always please do subscribe if you like what you hear check back there are 70 before this one and um, next week we have a very very glamorous guest uh, glamorous is that the right one? yeah i'm gonna go with that glamorous until then though here is fat white family on episode 71 of midnight chats Right, so you, so as you say, you've just got kind of back into like band world. You've had like a few weeks, I guess, of yeah. doing press interviews and stuff. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> and now you're kind of getting back into like the rehearsals. You're rehearsing this week. Yeah. And then for for when does the tour start? Tour starts on May first. So we got rehearsals this week. Then we got another. Oh, very nice. Uh, and then we got another uh, another like sort of session of rehearsals before we begin the tour. I mean, I'd like to think that we will still have the same lineup yeah. by tour. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what, what odds are you giving yourself that? I'd say it's like kind of... Uh, six to one. Six to one? I, no, I'd say it's like... 
I'd say give it, give it a good life. Three, seven, to, three, three, three to one. I'd say it's a three to one chance we make it to tour with the same membership that you'll see on like a poster. <coughs> I'm only saying six to one because there's seven people in the band and the Bucky, the, the, the house has to favour the bet. So the six to one, seven in the band. I'm giving you good odds. I think that's pretty, pretty, pretty hard. That's I think that's pretty cynical. But I mean, uh, but I'm the I'm the bookkeeper. At the moment, despite yeah, despite you know initial pangs of anxiety, I, th- I think we'll make it to to May first with the same lineup. Yeah. Inshallah. How does it feel to be kind of back into this though? Back into because it's been. I, I mean, I've never done a I've never done a a promo season before, really. Mm. Like this this thing, you know. Yeah. Where it's been like, feels like just months and months of kind of like. Just talking shit about yourself and uh, you know promoting and selling the record, you know, yeah. like which is which is which kind of fun initially, and then it's kind of I don't know after after a few months of it, you start to just become all discombobulated and kind of detached, and you, know? you don't listen to the thing for I haven't listened to it for ages. You yeah. start wandering around talking and talking about this thing, and uh, and then and then and then and then you got to sort of switch that bit of your brain off and go into sort of like playing again it's like oh right this is the thing that we do actually it's not just like you gotta remind yourself what those songs sound like you gotta remind yourself what those songs like sound like and that you're not like you know it's not your job to sort of traveling around talking and mm. you gotta sort of get back into it. but i mean I, I don't know i don't know we always play in south london in like little, little club nights and acoustic nights and stuff like that so we're always performing and working on things anyway so it doesn't feel like that much of a leap it's just it's a bit more pressure and a bit you know a bit more a bit more time you know, it requires more time. At the end of like the last bout of shows, I guess, end of 2016, after the, kind of when you wrapped up that record, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and kind of the, you played that big show at Brixton Academy and yeah, everything. And kind of from the outside, everyone around that time thought that maybe like the band, that was, that was it, the band were going to vanish now and, and yeah. it was over. That's, I guess, how people kind of, Put it across like the press were kind of saying that people presumed that. Did it? Did it ever feel like that for you guys? Did you always? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, it did feel it? Did did you, did it, it come close to that being the end of the? It band? was like uh, it's like that. It's like Terminator Two when the things all fucked and the bits are all the, the rubbles all spread it's slowly congealing right back together. All again. comes back together. Yeah, but the... real. But it was really it took ages. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was really slow. It was like yeah, they proper fucked him up. Like it was there was bits of him all over the place. You know, there's bits in New York, bits in Cambodia, <laughs> slowly sort of worming its way back to <laughs> to, to form formfulness again. I guess, um, I guess that's a good way to put it. But you knew it was going to come back. I think deep in my gut, I kind of knew we'd get on with it. I mean, what else were we going to do? You know? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of like, kind of a lot. A lot had gone into it mm. to just sort of throw it in the bin. And I don't know. Yeah. I, I kind of I, we we signed the deal straight away and started planning on doing the next thing straight away. So there wasn't a sort of period of like we're not doing it anymore. There was just a kind of like all right, well, went from end like ending that album run. To stress about the next one, really, mm. but like how how we did it was the thing that was painful. Right. Yeah, it was like Saul was gone, right? You have to just deal with that, you know. Half the band are all on heroin. Have to just deal with that, and it's just it's just a lot of problems. And no if problem. you really if you really really want to do it, and you really believe in what you're doing or whatever, then and also if you're at the added sort of uh, sensation of never really having kind of amounted to. I don't know, maybe your initial promise or whatever. I think that was a strong feeling of kind of like, we haven't really delivered, have we? Right, right. It seems a little bit like... It was unfinished business at that point. A bit embarrassing to just finish right. at that point. Sure. It would have been difficult to sort of, well, what what are we going to do now? Like, after all that kind of hullabaloo and like scorn we poured on like everything else, it's kind of like, it'd be a bit of a shame to go back to like making pizzas or whatever. It'd be like a... Well, imagine Rocky too. He comes out and loses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he gets a sprain. That's a good analogy. The, gets yeah. a sprain before the fight and just decides he doesn't want to do it. Right? Yeah, you know, he develops a codeine ha- habit. After pushing for that first draw in Rocky one, he kind of comes out and quits in Rocky two. He loses and goes, "Well, okay, fine. yeah." <laughs> I'm going home now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going back to the factory. He, develop, he develop, develops a subutex problem. <laughs> out of that, <coughs> out of the lineup that was then, though, at, the, at that moment, mm. how many, how much of that band is still this band now? About, it, about half. 
Okay. Yeah, there's me, Nathan, Adam Harmer, and Saul Adamczewski, obviously, um, that are kind of the the main group. And then there's Alex White, who came in around that time, but wasn't like a full <laughs> member, you know, mm-hmm. who's now really prominent and plays about like 17 different... In- when we finally got... We finally got somebody in the band that knows how to play music, which is really useful. That's key, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> really key, yeah. You can play... He's got like a, a sax, a, a baritone sax, two different keyboards. He's got Float. all this percussion. He's just surrounded by like instruments on one side of the stage. and You can harmonise like impeccably with... Anything. I think that's out of our own ladies, laziness as well. <laughs> I think I'm quite a difficult person to harmonise with because I can't. I don't really conventionally like sing very well, and often I'll just sing completely different things every time. Mm. You know, much to like the chagrin of Saul over the years. But like, Alex is so good at harmonies; he just clicks in almost like with whatever you're doing. So he's he's been a really great addition. He's a permanent member now for sure. Um, got a new bassist. We've got a new, a, a new bassist, Adam Brennan, who's kind of just been playing around the scene in South London. He was in like 12 different bands, like one of these guys who's just like obviously really hungry, which yeah. is a great thing to have in a band, I think, mm. you know. He's always there like bang on time. Right. Always He's probably really there keen. right now, thinking about crime. <laughs> 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 thinking about some tasty the, 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 crime. <laughs> <laughs> we've lost a few. We've lost a few, gained a few, and you know it's the same r- regime as before. Where you know, if you completely fuck shit up mid tour, then like you you you're gonna get sacked. Do you know what I mean? It's like no, I don't really have any. There's no other way to do it. I don't see any other way of doing it. I don't see any. Do you find those conversations when you have to? S- kind of give someone their marching orders. Do you find it e- easy to do, hard to do? No, not, not. Do you take them out to, for a nice meal? No, I'm just, or do you just say? <laughs> like in Jerry Maguire. <laughs> <laughs> take them down to Nando's. You brought me to Nando's to fire me. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I mean, Saul was the worst, but that we just got our tour manager to do that. We got, we got Pete Hamley to do that, man. I mean, it was the the war, the, 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 the thing had become so sour at that point, just so bitterly, bitterly sour. It was just like that was awful. But I mean, we just won't get in the van. Other than other than other than that, it's kind of like, I mean, if you've just come in the band or you've been in for a year, or whatever, and you just can't be. Bu- Most of the time, actually, people walk. Hmm. They don't really no, get. I've f- only had one walker. <laughs> Jack Jack Everett walked. Severin quit but that was post tour so he, he survived the tour he just didn't want to live in Sheffield mm. uh, uh, trying to think who else is there a lot of the time they just come and go with their own volition <laughs> 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 they come along they think oh there'd be a laugh yeah we'd be in a band playing for all them people it'd be great and then they're like ah do you know what actually no I'm going home <laughs> it's a lot of hard work no, yeah not. it's a lot of hard work and a lot of, of nasty vibes a lot of the time no, a lot of tension. Yeah. I think what's kind of like uh, quite different a fat white family, and I've always thought it's quite a quite a commendable trait of yours, is that you've always spoken really freely about this kind of stuff. About the, mm. but, you know, like a lot of bands, I guess traditionally always kind of like to pretend that everything's fine and everyone's getting on and it's great and they don't want to yeah. um, crush the brand. It, it does get on, but like you know, you go up high and then you go down low. Mm. Don't you? Yeah, I guess we 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 swing hard. I know yeah. what you mean though. Yeah, it's kind of I, I. I just find it impossible not to not to spill the beans, really. <laughs> just to just because you gotta you gotta vent like to to it's just like your therapy, isn't it's it? It's like yeah, when you talk to talk, when you do things like this constantly, it does become kind of ever so slightly therapeutic. It's like oh god, yeah, it's awful at the moment, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and why shouldn't people have a kind of picture of what it's actually like when you're you know while you're doing it? You know, I think it's I kind of it's kind like, of, like, like if you worked in an office and there was someone in the office that was fucking you off, like yeah. you'd go home and you'd say and you'd say. So and so has been. Yeah, yeah you like mm. it's just it's, it's a similar kind of thing, I guess. But yeah, I don't I don't think we go. You know, we don't trash like other people individually, personally, sit there and name names or whatever. You know, but it's like it's frustrating doing this because of you know A, B, and C, and you know I guess, I guess it's why not have a discussion about that and let people know exactly what goes on to a certain extent. You know? mm. um, Do you ever get tired of the fact that? If if people are defining the band as like this chaotic thing, um, I get I get a little bit I get a little bit tired of um, 
like recently, I mean, we've been having like a glowing reviews for this record, and they're still like, you know, South London degenerates. <laughs> right. That yeah, way. And it's yeah, like, yeah. well, hang on a minute, man. Like, you know, sure, everybody was like bang on the drugs and, and, and the rest of it. But I mean, I, everybody in this band's got like mental health issues and the rest of it. And it's like, you know, I don't know where people get off like repeating that over and over and over again, even once you put something far more kind of like developed on the table and mm. like what, what I mean what other justification do we have to sort of offer to sort of like rid ourselves of of that title you sure, know yeah, I yeah. think it at least shows that we have been if nothing else kind of dedicated to the music and that's kind of what it's about mm. not like behaving like a bunch of like yeah, morons is, you know bored people saying that and, shit. and we did behave like moron but it wasn't the whole point I think yeah, you gotta be you gotta let loose don't you you gotta be able to let loose. No one, no one likes boredom, do they? No. I mean, you guys were so dedicated to it, in fact, that you relocated to Sheffield. Yeah, exactly, man. Which is not something. Exactly. That's, not <laughs> that's quite a big feat. Yeah, not a lot of people city. would go and spend a year or two of their life in another part of the country where they don't know anybody and the social life's kind of gone and all the rest of it, just so they can kind of like get on with what they were doing, you know? I, I think. became a. a I kind of uh, adopted a kind of president stance. And for two years, well, I, like, stopped, like, I don't know, sensual things. Like, I didn't fuck or anything like that. No sex. Just for music, you know? Mm. So, well, how long Sacrifice. Monk-like. Yeah, sac sacrifice. And yeah, the hermitude like... up in Sheffield, that was what it was. It was a hermitude. No, it's like, come on. Like, well, you still, you were still wanking, though, weren't you? Yeah, but not that much. So you gave up on the sensual, like, you stopped fucking, but... You are still well, wanking. Well, you, you have a wank, like, what, every three days? It's not, like, bashing That's off every... That's a fucking lie, man. It's not like this. <laughs> I wasn't thinking, like, uh, you know, I was lonely. What about, you the, know, what about, the, what about the truckloads of ganja that you were smoking? Was that not sensual? Yeah, but that's to go in. Okay, and the ketamine? That's to go in deeper. <laughs> okay, so just masturbation, ketamine, weed, booze. Yeah, but... But other than that, not, a totally non-sensual... Not, not even booze. Other than that, it was a... It was a Pristine, almost. You don't. You don't retreat. take. You don't take like ketamine to go out, do you? Like, hey, I'm socialising with you now. Like, oh, you're on your own. I know you don't. Nathan. On a floor, you don't. You don't usually take heroin to go out either. Yeah, you can. Anyway, what why do you have to bring it down that fucking alley? I'm not going down that alley. I'm just, you know, if you're going to deny the sensual and then uh... the sensual was denied. <laughs> <Trying to> get... <laughs> <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Okay. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> what was it? What was it about? Um... So when did you move to Sheffield? Was that the beginning of 2017? We finished Brixton Academy, which was like, what, September or something, October mm. that year. And then we all went on, we all went on separate ways for a bit. Uh, Nathan went to uh, Mexico for a couple of months to get clean. I went to Cambodia, Laos to sort of wander around. Uh, Saul went to New York. So everybody went the, really their opposite ways for a few months. And then me and Nathan relocated back up, up north to Sheffield yeah. for the long haul. Yeah. It was the middle of winter. And that was just was that was just because you guys were like we got to get out we got to get out of it, town. It, it, it was a, it was a plan that had been floating around for a, for a, for a year or so. I tried to sort of move everybody up there a year before, knowing full well that it was kind of slowly imploding, but it had just fallen through. We didn't have the organisation or whatever. But we had a new manager uh, based in Sheffield, and uh, I'd started working in Sheffield because of the moon landings. So we already kind of knew a few people up there who could find us a little house, find us a little studio. So it was like just getting a van with your stuff, move up there, and at least there's somewhere for you to sort of start out, you know? Yeah. It wasn't like just showing up in Sheffield and going down the estate. I mean, you have to sort of, there was a little bit of planning that to go into it. Sure. Um, but yeah, we just packed a van full of stuff. And it was, and, and yeah, we had this little five bedroom house. It was like £700 a month or something like that. This little studio was like twenty five quid. It was like a bit, studio was a bit like this, but like overlooking a little canal in like this industrial kind of like estate, this industrial kind of wasteland at, at, a, cliff. at, at a cliff, mm. opposite a place called City Sauna. Did you ever watch? The, there was a show on Channel Four called A Very British Brothel. Brothel. Have you was, seen that? No, I haven't. I've seen a trailer for that. It's I amazing. To see that. It's work. amazing. Like episode one, they're trying to put in a glory hole, you know. But yeah, they put yeah, it in. Yeah. They, they put it in. It's not. It's not deep enough. It's like, oh, it's not. It's too shallow. It's too shallow. And they, they put it up too high. It's, it's, too, it's, too, it's, too, it's too high up for smaller gentlemen. And they have to put like another glory hole in. They have to make it slightly deeper. And it's like, 
Um, it's really, it's really funny, but that was opposite. That was like the only other uh, like thing going on in the area was just this brothel, you know. Right. Okay. Ropey as hell, you know. But uh, was it just you, it was just you two that moved up first? Is that right? And Me, Adam and Severin as well. Okay. Adam and Severin, but they didn't really stick stick it out too long. Severin really missed London. I mean, fair enough, really. I mean, he's you know London sort of born and bred and it's quite a big ask really and we didn't really have any idea what we were doing it's not like we had loads of like song ideas to sort of like what it was like day one like what were you gonna do from scratch yeah right, like okay. literally yeah. pissing around on keyboards and just like anything you know? so it was obviously gonna take a long time that became quite apparent you know it wasn't gonna be done in a six months it was gonna take it was gonna take a year how long, how long did it, it took a year? It took about a year. It took about a year. Okay. It took about a year of writing, but yeah. Was there a oh, moment when it, when it started to work? When you felt like there were a few, there were a couple of sort of yeah, there were a few songs or like rough ideas, like skeletons for tunes that were like okay, we've kind of got some kind of direction. The main one was feet, really. Mm. I think that was kind of like. It was good because it was so different. I mean, the original demo was just like real, like 10 minute long techno kind of like ketamine acid sort of like jam thing that was like, didn't say anything like Fat Whites, but it was kind of, it was curious to us, I think, because it didn't, you know, it was like, oh, like, this is interesting, you know, it's kind of like a challenge in a way, you know. So it was something a bit different. But we, we yeah, we, 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 there, was a, there was a few songs that kind of start to show up. And then you get to a point where you've nearly got like half a record and and then you kind of know that it's just about, yeah, you're going to pull it off at some point, you know. But the sure. first few months was a bit like, oh, fucking hell, oh, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like Sheffield, though? Just generally, like it, yeah, as a place. It's like, it strikes me as like a nice, creative place to be. Yeah, like, it's good. It comes from there. And... I, f I think if you want to like get your head down and work or whatever... It's kind of perfect, you know, it's so Doesn't cheap. Doesn't have the distractions, I guess. Doesn't have the distractions. Everybody's really sound. Everybody talks to each other. It's kind of, it's kind of a good, uh, it's a good, it's a good, I don't know, it's a good community kind of feel up there that you don't really get really so much in London anymore, I guess, mm. you know. Did you miss it down here? Were there elements of like yeah. town that you were like? Yeah, I miss, I miss it. I used to I come back down. I sad, but like, you know, you, you just move on. I can I, I left for a different, I, I, I was uh, running a studio a lot, but they go on tour. There's no point in keeping a studio going. Mm. If you're going to be on tour where all your money's going to run the business that so you're not even going to be running. Sure. So I'd just be like, I had to like cut that. And if I didn't have a studio there, it was, it was nothing for me to work on. So mm. yeah, I, mi I mean, I missed it. I, I used to come down a lot of different weekends and cut loose or whatever, you know, just see friends and that. But it's only two hours on the train. Mm. You know, it's not and that. And you're both back in town now. We're both in Streatham now at the moment. Yeah. For the yeah. time being, see where tour leads us. Yeah, exactly. You never really know when you start. Yeah. You get in a bus and then about a year later, you've got no idea what's going to happen. I read that you guys, whilst in Sheffield, were listening to, uh, I think the, the quote on your press release with the record is like, Jesus yeah. and George M Wham B side. Wham B side. One, what? just one Wham B side. Yeah, I was going to say, what, 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 is the, what is the 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 Wham B side? Blue armed with love. Okay, I, it's I that really hypnotic kind of. Yeah, yeah, play a bit. Yeah, it's really odd. But um, how did you cut? Did you? Is this just a tune that you knew from like you used to, He started what? playing that. Where just, did that come from? I was just uh, scrolling through YouTube and it came up, and I was like, "Holy shit, that's all right, isn't it?" Blue. Don't keep talking. Well, about, talking about I mean, stabbing something. <laughs> <laughs> keep keep them interesting. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I, the the easiest thing was that that was because I, I, I blame Lou Reed for that. That was that Talkhouse article he did, right? About Jesus, you know. And yeah, they get yeah, artists yeah, yeah. to write on different. Yeah. And I was I'd never listened to Kanye West before, and I was like, Lou Reed was just bigging it up, and I was like, oh man, maybe there's something in there. Yeah, I'm already in there. What was it the B side for? Top Top Gamma. Oh, right, okay, wow. Top Top Gamma, yeah. It does go on for about five minutes, doesn't it? Yeah. Look, we can talk and listen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Once George starts going, it's difficult to. I hear that. 
so sexy, isn't it? I was I was sad when George went. I was sad when George went. I was really went as well, sad. Yeah. Like, I, mean, I know it was at the end of that year when everyone went. Yeah, it was like Christmas yeah, yeah, Day yeah. when it was a tail end. Yeah, he like, really yeah, he managed to really see it. He managed he to snuck take, in under the, take the year, <laughs> under man. The radar, yeah, um, but I was like, oh, yeah, that one. I don't know. It got me for some reason. Yeah, but I mean, he had, I don't know. He just seemed like a really kind of. Just seemed like a great guy, didn't he? You know that whole "let's go outside" thing was just yeah. the best fucking thing ever. You know, really good. Yeah, that sh- that crystal. Uh, yeah, the way the toilet spam around, ra- oh, yeah, the urinal just, spam round just, into like disco balls. Love that attitude, man. <laughs> love it. Love it. I mean, I've always liked I've always liked George Michael, but then when he died, you get that thing, don't you? You have a sort of like renaissance. Yeah. You know? it's yeah like, oh true. man, he was he, he was amazing, wasn't he? Like, I wanted him to sing on songs for our mothers. Oh. But Saul shot down the idea immediately. I wanted him to do some like some of that groany shit he does there at the end of hits. Yeah, he hits, does do a good groan, doesn't he? I mean, do you reckon then, he would have done it? I reckon there's a. Th- there's I reckon a chance. from there's what I hear, chance, yeah, from yeah. what I hear about George Michael and his music tastes and his kind of like you know, I don't know his his, his general kind of like joy de vivre. Yeah, uh, I think <laughs> I, I think there's a pretty good chance he might have been like, oh yeah, I'll do a, I'll do a, you know, I'll do a groan for Fat White Family. I reckon there's a possibility. He would have done that. Yeah, yeah it's, I think it's sordid enough for George to maybe have gotten, <laughs> gotten, gotten into bed with it a little bit, you know. <laughs> so that's so that's what you would listen. You'd be listening to that track. We'd be what? listening to that track, and we'd be listening to we were listening to users kind of obsessively. I mean, it was, it was just really the juxtaposition between everything he was banging on about and our like little grey terraced house in Sheffield. I don't know, there was just something fantastical about it. It was like, you know, our little lounge with a head full of ketamine, just this kind of like sort of sunken kind of like LA kind of yeah. like, like this sort of incredible just towering narcissism and, <laughs> and bombast, you know, and just filth, just absolute filth of every kind. Yeah. And it, I, I don't know, it just felt like an affront to everything that I stood for, which I kind of, I, ne- I think I needed a shot of that at the yeah, time. Yeah, sometimes you need to just let that in. It's just like, ah, actually, fuck it, yeah, yeah. I'm kind of on board with this, actually. Yeah. <laughs> was, was, there, was there a moment, was there an actual moment when the kind of, the band all came back together that you can remember, like... I mean, it came back together a few times and then split up a few times and then, you know, it's like... Um, we're waiting for that <laughs> every year we're still waiting on that yeah I reckon in about two, May 1st Southampton May 1st, about, yeah. apparently rumour has it <laughs> that will be in the room at the same time yeah yeah man any, any day now man any day now we're going to get them all in the same room at the same time I can't, wait. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't actually wait it's going to be a buzz isn't it it's yeah. going to be but you, I'm buzzed I'm psyched <laughs> from that but from that moment where like you said like once you finished the last records tour and you kind of all went your separate way. Yeah. Um, Disperse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> different corners of the world. Did you then, like, when was the moment when you kind of, I mean, it's, I suppose it's different because you, you guys are brothers. You're kind of always in touch, I guess, to yeah, a certain extent. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. That yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily true. No? 30 years. Maybe you don't feel like it's true. But... Is it, is it, um, Hard being in band uh, in a band as brothers, or do you do you get that feeling like? Don't really more... think about it because we've always been in a band as brothers. So I can mm. yeah, compare it. It's, it's yeah, it's weird. You don't. Oh well, I mean, I don't know. I think uh, I think it, it's like anything else. It's got it's got you got pros and cons there, isn't it? Mm. I think um, you can irritate each other in ways that are kind of unfathomable to like normal people that are like just bystanders to the situation yeah, yeah. people that are kind of it's like, like the way your involved. parents always drive you insane exactly and yeah, someone else yeah. Is like, why are you being a dick to your mum like she's yeah she's exactly you go around someone's house and it's like oh man why are you talking to your mother like it's exactly like yeah. that you know like there's certain things he does that make me want to like smash his face in that yeah. well, like to other people are just completely like you wouldn't even notice them yeah 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 uh, and obviously there's kind of like you spend that much I mean me and him have always been in each other's company since mm. like well forever really I came to London when I was 18 and I think that was the only year I lived separate to Nathan and he showed up a year later and asked if I could if he could sleep on my couch because he got thrown out of school and he said he was going to stay for a week or two that was 14 years ago he he's still he's still and he's still he's still living like at my at my Fool. flat now you know Fool. <laughs> I remember he showed up at Liverpool Street Station with a little bag and that was that was the end of our time apart. Like, but I guess because of our parents' kind of like divorce and all this kind of crap that happened when we were growing up, moving around and stuff, we were always quite, 
quite tight inevitably you know? yeah and we were you know we were living in scotland and northern ireland and everything you know it was like always shifting around how many years are there between you two two and, three. and a half three two three quarters two and three quarters yeah, i think i'm looking younger. Using all of all i think i'm looking younger what do you who do you think looks younger I've got to say, I think Nathan's got the edge. Of course, the okay. huge edge, not right. just the edge. I'm saying the plateau, <laughs> the plateau that comes that comes before the edge. All right. All right. All right. No, I accept that. But, but you look good. Liam. No, I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the honesty. It's a kind of different. Uh, I thought I'd give it a try. You know, my brother's two years older than me, so mm. I'm like the you in that in that situation, right. like being the younger. Uh, do you do you have any other siblings? It's just we've got a, we've got a big brother. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So Who, that's a little bit different because it's just me and him, and. So I've always been like the youngest and therefore like the kind of mm. the fav you know, the youngest is always the favourite, right? Just no. They are, yeah, they <laughs> always you know get spoiled. Right? You, get, you got called the chosen one. <laughs> Who did? Well, my father calls me the chosen one. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, <laughs> to, be that's, chosen, that's, to be chosen that's by your father. That's, that's, that's cold, isn't it? That's cold. <laughs> to be chosen, it is cold. But to be chosen by your father is is, is meaningless. It's, it's all about your mother's love. That's the, that's the love that counts. That's true. That's you know, true nobody, yeah. father's love, isn't, it's, it's irrelevant, man. I mean, yeah. it's... Nathan, are you your, your mum's favourite? Of course he is. I'm not little, she, she these little, hold, these little darling. Me. She wouldn't hold me as a baby. She wouldn't <laughs> hold me. <laughs> That's because you shit and scream and vomit everywhere the whole time, but she still put up with you. That's how deep her love is. Yeah, you know? I guess. You know, there's love there. So in terms of making Surf's Up, mm. when you were making it, when you were all together and you were putting it putting it together up there. Were you all getting on? Was it all, was it like a happy record to make? Uh, well, I mean, yes and no. They, when we were actually doing the record, it was fine, but there was a whole kind of like beef that went off with Nathan just before we started uh, the, the proceedings. And, and he was basically, well, he went on strike or he was asked to leave. It was kind of a bit, it's a bit confusing now actually exactly what happened, but Nathan wasn't there for the first bunch of sessions and that kind of cast a big shadow over everything. Mm. But it was all to do with hang-ups with Saul from the past when Saul had been like mad on crack and a complete like fucking barbarian and it sort of traumatized everybody really kind of back then, you know, and it was kind of to do with all that behavior. Although Saul was kind of claimed, came to this one clean and lucid there were a lot of hang-ups there and a lot of shitty politics to sort of sift through eventually it's fine but mm. initially it was kind of like we well we couldn't really be in the same room together i mean we did for a while we had some good times we went out to norway to plan the record with our friend owns a, like a little house up by a fjord there and do the last bit of writing and we planned everything but it wasn't exactly smooth no but, but when we were actually in the sessions it was all quite this time around was actually really quite fun yeah mm. songs for our mothers was just pure pain but this was actually everybody working around each other and it was a bigger team of musicians as well you know does it affect do you feel like the the music that comes out of it do you think that's greatly affected by just how well you're getting on because you know there are some yeah. bands like historically a band like black sabbath for example believed that if you were friends with the rest of the band and that was going to make for terrible music they loved the fact that they kind of hated each mm. other um and as we as I've already said, like some bands kind of feel like they have to pretend that they love each other. Mm. Um, do, do you think it like affects the end result? Like the music is like this record compared to your previous records and the relationships that you've all had. I think uh, I think on 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 one level uh, for for us, it's definitely way better if everybody's communicating quite openly and getting on. Mm. But then on another sort of uh, almost more profound level, I think uh, what's kind of made this record, for me, the best one anyway, is that uh, other people's ideas are at the at the fore. And the, 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 I guess the war that, that did occur within the group over this record was over that and over who, whose ideas get prominence and who is the kind of overall caretaker of those ideas and who's Nathan's in charge loads on this Nathan track, wrote a yeah. bunch so the conflict kind of came from that situation so right. even though there was a kind of contentment and a open communication within the studio when he wasn't there the whole thing was kind of born of this sort of like uh, this conflict of, of interest and this power struggle so that didn't really go away completely it was just sort of like om omnipotent in a way you know like mm. uh and it took ages to resolve. I so it's, it's a it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both worlds. I mean, personally, I mean, I'd rather I'd rather it all, you know, I'd rather everybody got on and 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 and, and, and communicated openly. But mm. there's always I think there's always going to be a part where it's kind of like 
it's kind of a war, a bit of a conflict. When you're collaborating, it's kind of too yeah, fraught. You can't, you can't really foresee any external kind of forces coming coming within sometimes. So you could get everything settled within the band, but then something happens outside and it throws a whole spanner in the works. It's, you know, it's the same in any relationship. Yeah. It's always going to fuck up. I think a bit, yeah, you need, you, you, need, you, you, you need a bit the, of conflict, innit? The more, the, more, the more conflict, the more you fuck up. Like, I think you're trying to use that situation. I think the better you'll be able to handle it in the future. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, I think as a group of people, you're just, working your way through like uh, these conflicts and these things. You know, you're working your way through your relationships with each other. You're trying to sort of salvage it by doing this music. You know, you like if you got a puppy, you'd want your puppy to be shitting on the floor as much as possible in its first six months. Right. So it could then not shit on the floor after, <laughs> yeah. you know, just like, so you have to give it a little smack, you get into violence, maybe think about snapping its neck. <laughs> okay. And then... The crime of passion. Uh, yeah. The crime of passion. And, and, and then, then the maybe, cloak, and then... yeah, it will be a good dog. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think with this, re- obviously, because the, the record came out last week, no, this week. Friday. It comes, comes out, out comes Friday. Out Friday, yeah. Do you think, like, because people have kind of historically loved to be outraged by your music mm-hmm. do you think there's anything in this record what do you think people are going to be going to be able to find the amount of outrage they will want to I think if they, if they sift around long enough they'll <laughs> find the outrage that they so desire yeah I definitely put some outrage in there okay I just made it slightly less explicit this time um, I, I, I think I've, I've had a lot more kind of, of, of an open approach to writing the thing and kind of it's definitely more idiosyncratic as far as I'm concerned and I haven't been kind of so conscious of giving people sort of signposts and ironic kind of like explicitly ironic kind of gestures and things like that. Just keep it kind of, I wanted it to sort of be sort of, sort of elusive, you know, like you have to sort of chase it a little bit to kind of get it, you know. Sure. Like it doesn't just sort of like occur to you straight away. Mm. That's the way I thought about it. That might sound incredibly pretentious, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't listening to that one being that. <laughs> when I told a friend of mine who writes for the magazine and um, Daniel Dillon Ray, I told him that we were recording this and I said, is there anything you think I should ask these guys? And he's from Sheffield. Mm-hmm. He's lived there forever, still lives there. And he asked me, the three questions he told me to ask, they're all Sheffield Bays. Mm-hmm. One of them said, ask them about their first ever gig in the city and the football hooligan. Oh, right, yeah. What, yeah, is, yeah. That? what is that? He first part of the Bear Blades crew. Yeah. Oh, right, of uh, Sheffield. Yeah. United. It sounds a lot more, but they're, they're called the Blades, Sheffield. Yeah, yeah, sure, It's not yeah, like yeah. they've got loads, the of, got loads of Blades. Yeah. The BBC, but, they call them. But he did come in with a big machete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. He took Adam Harmer's guitar and walked off down the street with it. He threatened everybody in, in, in the bar. Where and was it? Where was this was on it? London, London Road, where London we ended Road. up living, like five years later, like just right. off London. This little pub, I can't remember the name of it. That's oh, changed hands. It's now. Changed hands, I think. Yeah. Oh, what year is this? Like two thousand and. It's like two thousand and fourteen, like okay. early days. You know, it was a tiny pub. There was about thirty people there, and we, you know, this was our first time. And we were just like, man, it's proper sketchy up here, isn't it? Proper shit all up here. <laughs> <laughs> we're never moving. Never there. fucking going back to Sheffield, man. I'm the don't don't get out of the van, man. <laughs> so, what, so, so you were playing a show in this pub, and a, what a guy turns up, yeah, with, with a machete. Proper heavy, yeah, yeah. Old, and old and old. to fair, fair play to the landlord, he went out after him up the street, you know, and they got the police, and they managed to get Adam's guitar back, you know. But he was really angry. He was really upset. I don't know what he was upset about. But he sh- <laughs> the same guy, right? Randomly, the next time we came to play Sheffield, yeah, we, we, this had become like you know folklore within the band, like Sheffield man, the fucking nuts up there, Bear Blades crew, BBC, you know. And we got to Sheffield, and everybody was kind of a little bit, you know, for the next you know gig, and it was like a little sold out show at the Harley. <laughs> and we were all like sketching anyway because we're on tour and we're all haggard from the speed and we were all sit downstairs in the bar having a pint and he walks in the exact same guy he sits down opposite three of us sat there he points at the drum he goes you come here <laughs> like that. It was just like what the fuck is wrong with this guy you know is he like following the band around or something like how have we what have we done to what aggravate this like did your drama go over to him no nah, man we all went upstairs <laughs> and we didn't come back down until the gig we were like fuck sheffield man this place is wrong you know <laughs> it was it was it was terrifying man because our nerves were already rattled from that first bout of proper touring but you come here so that so that was your first ever gig in the city. Mm. Your, 
Second was the Harley. That was the one where I covered myself in my own shit, like it was, like I was a native. That was Dan's second question. Yeah. yeah. Ask him about that second empty <laughs> and, so and the dirty protest. Yeah, that was the, the way he So the second it. one that the guy showed up at, that was the dirty protest. Yeah, because they were that they were. It was you know you got given drinks tokens. It was like you have a, you can have a cider or an ale. It was like can I have a beer, and they were like no, you can't. And I was like it's a sold out gig. I mean this is my first ever proper tour where it's like fourteen gigs in a row. And this is like gig. Six, you know. So I've already started to learn that if you take a lot of ecstasy on night one and a lot of speed, that by a gig like five or six, you pretty much want to hang yourself and never go on stage ever again. So <laughs> I was learning like the hard way, and I, you know, and I was very angry at this point in time because you know I don't think we've been signed yet. So you're working full time, but you're still just destitute. You know, it's kind of like yeah. what is going on here? All these people are here. Why don't you know? Yeah. Why don't I have like a, a hotel room or like anything? You know. And now you're being refused a beer. And now you're, refu you're being refused you're a beer, beer. Right. and you know, I, I get like gut rot anyway, and I get terrible nerves. And I've been kind of like schooling myself on Gigi Allen. And at that point in time, I was like, well, nobody really cares, but obviously it's kind of like, well, let's just see how far we can push this. You know what I mean? Let's see how like, how nasty a kind of like performance you can actually put on just to sort of, just to see, test you know, it. just to test it, yeah. So and what I took, happened? What like well, what I was, was the react? What was the reaction? I mean, it was like it was like Moses. I felt like Moses, you know. It's like you could just cut through this this <laughs> this crowd of people like they were like not not even there, you know. But I I sort of put my hand down, I shat in my hand and put <laughs> put it across my face like like you know Indian war paint or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and then just started going at it, you know, like going at it, just attacking the audience and that. But it was, it was, it was amazing. And my whole band were, were, were terrified. Even Saul was scared of me for once. I went towards Saul on stage. He was like, back it off, you know. The only like, one... At that point, Nathan, were you, what were you thinking at that point? It's just lost it. it smelled horrible. Were it smelled you... really bad. Were you just <laughs> thinking he's lost, he's actually lost his mind now? Oh, no, I didn't think he'd lose his mind. It's just hard. It smelled like baby shit. It didn't smell like adult shit. <laughs> so it's just like, oh, fuck off, get away from me, man. Yeah, it was funny. The, the only one that didn't notice was Adam Harmer because he was on so much drugs. So I ended up like tonguing him on stage, like covered in my oh own my shit. God. And he didn't notice until after the gig, man. Oh. And, but there was one guy in the crowd who was really into it. It was really weird. And I was like, I was naked from, I was wearing a suit, but I was naked from the waist down. And this guy, I, you know, he, he kept like pushing into me. He was the only guy who would give it any, you know. And I ended up, I ended up like on his shoulders, riding him around, like whipping him with his belt. I mean, somehow I got his belt off, and I ended up on his shoulders. And I was sort of like riding him around the Harley, like he was, a, like he was a horse or something, <laughs> covered in this shit, wearing this suit, but with not. And it was like it was it was really like as, as kind of low down as I think it's. So Sheffield's got <laughs> there's energies in Sheffield. <laughs> What did you think the next day? Like when you, I thought I bet the rest of the tour is going to sell good now. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> People that want to see this band after that, I'm not sure. You know? <laughs> I felt proud, man. I felt like ah, you know, that was a, you know, that was another frontier. I don't have to do it again. I don't have to do it every night or anything. But at least I, I, I was interested to know how that feels mm. to be in like a, a crowd of people and have this music and a, and a microphone and. And be covered in your own feces, you know. It's just like a curious. No regrets at all over that one. No. <laughs> None. I mean, you know, and they and they call us degenerate. Yeah, that's where it's come. That's self-expression, mm. and, and it's most like visceral. Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com.